I'm going to read from Second uh, Timothy, the fourth chapter for our text tonight. This is found in verses 7 and 8. There the apostle Paul wrote, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. I find that stressed, the righteous judge, the Lord, the righteous judge. That's what we want to talk about tonight in our lesson. The term the Lord is used of Jesus Christ here in this passage in verse 1 and also as we can see down in verse 22 of the same chapter. Thayer, the Greek scholar, says of this passage and of this word, there are some who hold that Paul, except in his quotations from the Old Testament, uses the title Kyrios, Lord, everywhere, not of God, but of Christ. I do believe he is referring to the Lord, Jesus Christ, in the incident, a famous incident in the book of Genesis, when deity appeared to Abraham in the long ago. Perhaps you're familiar with the account that tells us about Abraham sitting in his tent in the heat of the day among the oaks of Mamre, and he looks out across the plain, and he sees three men coming. And he ran toward these men and bowed down after the oriental fashion and uh, also offered his hospitality, which was also customary to people in that day. He welcomed these visitors with foot washing and the best food available. The three men who appeared to Abraham were, among others, among the angels, the pre-incarnate Christ or Jehovah, as the American Standard Version renders that account, and Yahweh sometimes is also used. But this was the Lord Jesus Christ, as we learn from reading this. And also from Genesis 18 and 22 and 19 and 1, we find that the Lord, Jehovah, is the one who is named. God also gives to us an example here of entertaining angels, as mentioned in Hebrews 13 and 22. In fact, this passage in Hebrews probably refers to this incident, that we are to offer hospitality. And he says, in this way, some have entertained angels unaware. Well, also we find in this incident, God becoming the guest of one of his saints, as in Revelation 3 and 20. You remember that God had made a promise in the 17th chapter of Genesis to Abraham when he was 100 years old that his wife would bear a son, something that Abraham had probably longed for and hoped for, but had not received at that time. This was the message that was brought to Abraham, that the time had come for this to take place. His wife would bear a son. Seems that Sarah, after the fashion of her gender, was listening behind the door, and she heard this news, and uh, she laughed within herself. One of the three men was now clearly identified as Yahweh or Jehovah, who proved his omniscience by knowing Sarah's thoughts and chastising her just a little bit about it. Now, because Abraham was the friend of God and all the nations of the earth will be blessed by him, Abraham was allowed the high privilege of learning something about God's principles of dealing with with those nations. God said in Genesis 18 and 20, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done according to the cry of it, which is come unto me. And if not, I will know. You see, God was very concerned about Sodom and Gomorrah. It evidently was a great city and the environs round about. But because of that grievous sin, God, in this statement, has shown his intention to exact punishment upon it. This tells us, friends, that God's justice moved him to demonstrate that he had a full possession of the facts, 
unlike men today who sometimes rush to judgment, he wanted to make sure that it was as the cry had come to him. So the two angels went to Sodom, and the Lord stayed with Abraham. And Abraham expressed concern for the people in Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 23, he said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? The boldness of Abraham's faith to ask such a question of God astounds us. It absolutely causes me to think of awesome thoughts. The idea of saying to God, will you destroy the righteous with the wicked? It surely is based on the assumption that God will deal fairly. Certainly not on the assumption that he will deal unjustly. It would not have occurred to Abraham that he might be more compassionate than the Lord. But Abraham recognized that there was a possibility of the perishing of righteous men in this catastrophe of Sodom and Gomorrah, even his own relatives. For you remember that Abraham's nephew had chosen to go the way toward Sodom. The Bible says in the book of Genesis that he pitched his tent toward Sodom. And of course, when men pitch their tent toward a certain direction, they usually go there. And so he wound up in Sodom among the wicked people of that place. The Bible says they vexed his righteous soul day by day. And yet it seems to me that he was almost the mayor of that city. He was sitting out in the entrance welcoming strangers when the angels came. And uh, Abraham realized that. And as much as he hoped that Lot and his family might be rescued, he's not so narrow and selfish as to think only of them, only of his own. As Leupold says, one might almost say that with a heart kindled by the love that God imparts to faith, Abraham ventures to plead the case of God's love over God's righteousness. He began to bargain with God. And although we might sympathize with Abraham, probably none of us would be capable of speaking to God in the way that he did. But behind his speaking lie absolute confidence in God's fairness. Abraham asked a question that really needs no answer because it is so obvious. He says, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Of course, the answer is, he will. And this points out that he's the judge of all the earth. He's not one of those tribal deities that some of them worship around here. He's not one of those idols that can't speak or hear or act. No, God is the judge of all the earth, and he will do right. And so the Lord answers, Oh, if I find 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare the place For their sakes, 50 righteous people in the great environs of Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities round about. Well, Abraham speaks with a due sense of unworthiness, realizes that he's just dust and he's speaking to the judge of all the earth. And he's fully aware of the boldness of his act. Very cautiously, he drops but five from the first stipulated 50, 45. And although he never grows presumptuous, Abraham pleads his case with God until the Lord states that he would not destroy the place if ten righteous people could be found. The question Abraham asked, shall not the judge of all the earth do right, carried its own answer and implied the faith that Abraham had in God's doing right. Today you and I, need Abrahamic faith. We need the faith that Abraham had, that the judge of all the earth will do right. You know, sometimes I'm posed questions by people who are concerned about loved ones. They want to know about their fate. And I tell them this, the judge of all the earth will do right. He will do what's fair. He will do what's right. He will do what he's promised in his word. And we need to rely upon that. I think about how some have questioned the goodness of God in appointing death. You know, I've talked to people who said, you know, I can't believe in a God that would allow my loved one to die. 
I don't think God is right in doing that. And thus they question the righteousness of God. The Bible says in Hebrews 9 and 27, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. There's no question that the death of loved ones is one of the most heart-wrenching experiences of man. There's absolutely no question about it, that it leaves us behind with our hearts bleeding and broken and our eyes wet with tears. And it's grief almost too much to bear sometimes. But does the judge of all the earth do right when our loved ones die? While we are in such grief and sorrow. Well, it's true that death is described in the book of Corinthians as our enemy. It is an enemy in that sense. But we must not question the judgment of the judge of all the earth. What we need to do is to look at it as the appointment of a wise and benevolent father in heaven. Because although the body returns to the dust, we're told in Ecclesiastes, the seventh chapter and verse 12, that the spirit returns unto God who gave it. It's in his custody. It's in his keeping. And after man sinned over there in Eden, death became necessary to the human family. God didn't want man to live forever in a state of sin and rebellion. And so death became necessary. God wanted something better for man. So he appointed for him a transition into a place that was free from sin and sorrow. It is in that land of perfect day that Revelation 21 and 4 applies that says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. There man may eat of the tree of life, which was once in the Garden of Eden, now has been translated to heaven, and live Forever, according to Revelation 2 and 7. Thus we learn that the one who appointed death also appointed eternal life, that we may live forever in the beautiful place called heaven if we qualify ourselves for it. So death is essential because those flesh and blood bodies that we have cannot enter the kingdom of God, we're told by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 and 50. They are not adapted for heaven. In death, we put off what the scriptures refer to in Philippians 3 and 21 as that vile body. And we are clothed with a spiritual body like unto his glorious body at some time, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 54. So in this world, we have death that we might have life. As the poet hath said, no life is but by death. Something's expiring everywhere to give some other breath. Suppose that no animal, no plant, no human being should ever die. If all life should multiply and continue to multiply without ever knowing death, then life here on this planet would become unbearable and impossible. Instead of looking at death as impoverishment, the Apostle Paul looked at it as great gain. The Apostle Paul said when he approached the hour of death, he said, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now that was true of Paul because to him to live meant to continue to preach the gospel, to spread the good news of Christ. But to die, he realized that would be better, he said, better for him. It would be preferable to life. If we view life and death that way, as Paul did, then we can approach it without fear. But you know, he said to me, to live is Christ. That's the predicate. Now, to some, life to live is worldly gain. To some, to live is pleasure. To some, to live means riches and wealth and glory and honor. And if that's our case, then when death comes, it will end it all and will leave us with empty hands and empty hearts. No, to die as a Christian, the Bible says, is gain. But then others have thought themselves more righteous than God in the matter of eternal punishment. Jesus, the blessed Savior, the one who gave his life for us, spoke more of hell and eternal punishment 
perhaps than anyone else. And he said in Matthew 25 and verse 41, Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. That tells me that hell wasn't prepared with a human beings in mind. It was prepared for those rebellious angels. But I want to tell you that ever God dishonoring, Christ rejecting sinner will go to that place that was prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew 5, 25 and 46, Jesus said that those on the left end, these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Now that tells me that just as long as life is eternal, that's how long eternal is the punishment. Because eternal and everlasting are equal terms. There's no difference actually between the terms. And if it's eternal life, if it's everlasting life, the opposite must be eternal punishment. Second Thessalonians 1 and 9 speaks of it. Paul says, Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power? The principle of eternal punishment proves rather than disproves the righteousness of God. Sometimes people say, oh, I couldn't believe in a God that would send a man to hell. Well, of course, God doesn't send people to hell. People choose to go there. It would not be right to allow sinners to go to heaven. That would rob heaven of its celestial quality. Sinners have troubled earth long enough without letting them go to heaven to trouble it. So heaven, among other things is a place where the wicked cease from troubling and when the weary be at rest, according to Job 3.17. Revelation 21 and 27 said, There shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. No, all of those troubling sinners, all of that wickedness will not enter heaven, and God would be unjust to allow it. Why don't you know that the fact that God provided punishment is in keeping with right and it is to his glory? That's illustrated by civil affairs. A nation is glorified by its honest citizens and its reproach for allowing criminals to run at large. The criminals in our nation bring punishment upon themselves by disobeying the laws. In like manner, the disobedient to God judge themselves unworthy of everlasting life, as the apostle said in Acts 13 and verse 46, and thus bring eternal punishment upon themselves. For whatsoever a man soweth, Paul said, this is God's eternal principle, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You can't live in sin and reap heaven. You can't sow murder and injustice and all of those things and expect to inherit eternal life. No, though God allowed criminals to go to heaven, pretty soon it'd be like it is here on earth, where people are afraid sometimes in their own homes, where criminals break through and steal. They'd be digging up the streets of gold and gouging out the pearls and the pearly gate. They'd be doing everything that they could do here on earth if God allowed it. So God is a righteous judge and will not allow sin to go unpunished. Others have questioned the righteousness of God because of his chastisement. But this too is done because of his love for man. Hebrews 12 and 6 says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. I'm sure that we recognize that even a human parent has to correct his offspring. If he loves him, he will, because love prompts chastisement. You know, I met a woman one time who was a member of the church, but she continually asked me the question, why is God being so mean to me? You know, actually, a lot of our troubles are of our own making. The idea that God singles out some person and is mean to that person because of some disobedience on their part is purely imagination. No, uh, in the parable of the vine and branches, Jesus pictures the father as a husband or a vine dresser, John 15 and 1. Now, you know, I've seen the vineyards out in California when they are being pruned. 
for development. Sometimes you go by a vineyard and there's just a great mound of branches that they have lopped off. And that's because those unnecessary branches sap the produce of the vine. And it's necessary. The pruning brings the chastisement to that vine brings about production. And uh, the vine dressed carefully prunes the productive branches so that they may bring forth more fruit, we're told in John 15 and 2. And even though the pruning may be momentarily painful, it's strictly for their good. And the same is true of man. The fact that God chastises us and leads us providentially into times of testing is good. David said, for example, in Psalm 119 and 71, It is good for me that I have been afflicted, because out of disappointment, out of afflictions, come real character. It's the opposing winds that lift the kite and take it to the heights that it reaches. I'm told that uh, sometimes the trees up on the ridge are the stoutest and the strongest because they withstand the winds that come. And in the same way, the chastisement that we meet in this life makes us stronger of character and fits us for the travel that we do toward heaven. But then men question the fairness and righteousness of God when it comes to the matter of one faith and one body. Some think it unjust of God to condemn religious people who do not hold to the true faith. But it must be evident that God gave only one faith. Matthew 16 and 18, we find Jesus making a promise. He said, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That was according to a divine plan. Jesus didn't build the church as a, substitute for his kingdom, as some teach. Some teach that, well, he came to build his kingdom, but really, uh, because of the reaction of the Jews, he just built the church as a substitute for it. And one of these days, he's going to come and build his kingdom. No, friends, it was according to the divine plan. The Bible says in Ephesians 2.16, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity or the hatred Thereby, And then Paul writes in Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, There's one body and one spirit, even as you're called, and one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. We read of seven ones there, and one of those is the one body. What is that one body? Colossians 1 and 18 says, The church which is his body. So the body is the church. I made the mistake one time saying, well, uh, the Bible can't make it any plainer than that, than to say there is one body. One of the older brethren called me aside, still a young preacher, and he said, oh, the Lord makes it plainer. I said, he does? He said, yeah, turn over there to 1 Corinthians 12 and 20. He said, we have many members, yet but one body. So I had to admit that's plainer, isn't it? Not only is there one body, Paul said there is but one body. And that one body, of course, is the church. Jesus wanted unity. He wanted us all to be one religiously. He said, neither pray I for these alone. Speaking of his little 11 disciples, the little flock as he called it. But for them also which shall believe on me through their word. That they all may uh, be one as thou father art in me and I in thee. That they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me. One of the things that's the antithesis to faith today is the fact that there's so many different faiths, so many different doctrines, so many different bodies that are being promulgated in the world. And yet Jesus prayed in the agony of the Garden of Gethsemane that all might be one. So if man had not departed from God's way, there would be no religious division. So man rather than God is responsible for all of these human churches. And for all of these human creeds with their characteristic self-interest and bigotry and for their opposition to each other. Now man wishes to change the Bible to fit the present state rather than to change the state to fit the Bible. 
God's word, however, is unchangeable. Brother told me one time, he said, you know, the difference in Christianity and in communism is that communism holds the theory that if you change conditions, it will change the man. He said Christianity believes that if you change the man, you change the conditions. You know, if we could make Christians out of all the world today, then it would be like a paradise here on this earth, it seems to me, if people were really Christians. I've been asked the question, what would you do uh, if uh, uh, somebody broke into your home and was killing your wife and all of this, you know? Uh, Well, what would you do if everybody felt like you do, that you can't kill and take people's lives? I said, well, there wouldn't be any murder, would there? There wouldn't be any war. There wouldn't be any division in the world today. We'd all be one in Christ Jesus. So man's way is the wrong way. God's way is the right way. God's word is unchangeable, Mark 13, 31. So there's no alternative except to change the world to fit God's word, to change the individual, and he'll change the world. Now, there can only be done by a complete return to the Bible. That's because divisions have come as a result of additions to, subtractions from, and changes to the Bible. All such perversions are condemned. About three places in God's Word, we read God's warning. Deuteronomy 4 and 2, for example, that we're not to add unto God's Word or take from it. Also, in another place, that is found. And then over in Revelation 22, 18 and 19, God repeats that warning that we're not to add to and we're not to take from God's word. And uh, that's like in the front of the Bible, in the middle of the Bible, in Proverbs, and then in the book of Revelation. God meant for us to keep it as it is. 1 Corinthians 4 and 6, he said also that we're not to think of men above that which is written. Uh, When your preacher or anybody else tells you that God doesn't mean what he says here, you're not to take the preacher's word, you're to take the Bible's word because the Bible we know is right. Unity encourages faith and peace, many other good things. Psalm 133 and 1 says, How good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. How wonderful it is when people are united in their opposition to evil and sin and united in their worship and service toward God. So surely these attributes are to be preferred to infidelity and strife and heartache. I'm sure you would think it would be hypocritical for one man to preach all of these contradictory doctrines. You know, if I showed up next Sunday and I preached that uh, man is saved by faith only, without any obedience on his part. And then the next Sunday I preach that a man has to obey the gospel in order to be saved. And then I preach that a man can't fall from grace if once in grace, always in grace. Uh, Then the next Sunday I preach that man not only can fall from grace, God warned against it and told us what to do if we do fall. People would say, well, that preacher is the most contradictory person I've ever heard in my life. He doesn't even agree with himself. Well, if it would be contradictory for one man to do that, what about ten men to preach these contradictory ideas? So the idea of one faith is just as, just as reasonable as the idea of one Lord, one God, and all of the other ones that are taught there in Ephesians 4 and 5. Lastly, tonight I want to say that when a man decides that God is wrong about something, then he has decided that he is more capable of judging and is more just and more righteous than God. That happens a lot. I'm told of a young man who had a friend who was killed in a car wreck. And his statement was, I can't believe in a God who would do such a thing. I don't know why he thought that God was responsible for the friend being killed in a car wreck, why that was God's fault. But in saying that, here's what he did. He exalted his judgment above God's judgment. His righteousness above God's righteousness. 
The Bible says in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, that the heaven, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And Isaiah 64 and 6 says, All of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. If a matter comes up and we cannot understand with our finite minds, we should be content to leave it in the hands of the infinite God, the God, the just and righteous God of all the earth. And we should accept by faith the glorious fact that the judge of all the earth will do right.